Gentlemen, welcome to the evening, Jones. All right, if you're watching evenjones.com, I want you to log on, use Twitter profile, Facebook profile, whatever kind of profile you got, go ahead and use it. Once you do, you can participate in our chat room. You can also send in your questions, type them out, put them up on the screen. I'll answer them. Um, I guess I talked to you guys last week. I'm trying to think of anything like uh, particularly uh, eventful has gone on in my universe and existence since then. I don't really have an answer for you on that. Yeah, nah, I guess it ain't really been cracking like that. Although, I mean, I guess we might as well get to it. I'm sure this is a question somewhere. Um, here we go. So you never tried peeing in the shower. So let me explain to you guys what has happened. Okay. On Dan Levitar's radio show, they did a poll. And I don't know how this came up in the first place. But 80%, 80% of the respondents in the poll say that they pee in the shower. 80%. I figured that that was just a cross-section that represented not so much the greater population, but just the nasty motherfuckers that, like, listen to Dan's radio show, All right, Like, the only conclusion that I drew from that is something that I've been telling him for a very long time and something that I feel confident in saying, uh, which is my listeners are better than his. And by the way, that is that is indisputably true. Like if you did not know this and I tell you how I know that that's indisputably true. You can go look through my mentions. And see the kind of crazy stuff that people say to me after I come on his show because they so mad that I showed up. That don't happen when people come on as guests of my show. We know how to act. We just a little bit more civilized. And these cats is out here pissing in the shower. Now, my man here says, so you never peed in the shower. You know what? I don't think I have. I do not because I wasn't like taking showers when I was like four or five years old. And I would assume that peeing in the shower is something that you do when you are four or five years old. And so I hypothesized that women would be mortified to find out that you dudes were out here peeing in the shower like this. Right. And I'm talking about this on the radio with Mike Golick Jr. And I'm like, I am sure that your mother would be terribly ashamed of you if she knew that you were out here telling the world that you pee in the shower. Mike Golick's mother got on Twitter and sent me a tweet that in so many words said that she also pees in the shower. The explanation that you guys have given me about peeing in the shower is that it saves water as if you give a damn about saving water, right? Like that's some retrofitting shit that you came up with after you decided you were going to be the one to pee in the shower. Like you ain't no damn environmentalist doing this. You're not. And you know how I know? No, I can't even say that part. But you ain't no environmentalist behind this. That ain't why you know. No, their argument is that urine is sterile. Again, something that you probably figured out retroactively. Something that you figured out after the fact. My argument against peeing in the shower is pretty strong. And you have no argument against this. What is right by the shower? What's always right by the shower? Anybody? Anybody? What's always right by the shower? The toilet is right by the shower. Why can't you go when you get out? 
why can't you go before you go in? If you live a life where you can get in the shower and not think you have to pee, but then once in it, have to pee so bad that you pee in the shower, why don't you just pee before you get in the shower every time, right? Since you want to be a child, why not be a child and use the bathroom before you leave so you don't have to pull over five minutes into the drive? That's all I'm saying. And what kills me about the fact that these dudes are out here peeing in the shower is their vehement defenses of peeing in the shower. Right? The guy says he does it because I can get it straight in the drain. You hear he said? Because I can get it straight into the drain. But you don't always get it straight into the drain. I know damn well that you don't. Right? You didn't say, I always go in the drain. You said, I can get it in the drain. Now, I had these cats say this. Like this guy, Marcus, says, ladies pee in the shower, too. I seen it. And my question is, where did you see it? Where did you see it? I just want to know who these women are that you're kicking it with. That's all I want to know. Or who are these women that you are perversely eavesdropping on to see them peeing in the shower? You can live with a woman and never have any idea that she has had a bowel movement while you were in the house. But you out here with women who pee in the shower in front of you. Or you just watching that on the internet. Is that what you looking up? Is that your search term? Is that what you're trying to see? But I came to find out, apparently, more ladies than I ever would have thought of is peeing in the shower. And I may say this, too, because I see people in the chat. They talking about uh, the people who pee in the shower, the same people who don't wash their legs. Yo, I would have thought at first that we could absolutely blame this on white people. But no, I have had quite a few black people forcefully and vehemently explain to me that they pee in the shower. I will say that it's all dudes. All right. I don't know about the black women that's out here peeing in the shower. Are y'all out here? Are any of you in the chat room? Are you going to defend this as fervently as the rest of the shower pissers are? I just don't understand why y'all are so forceful about it. Except I do understand why y'all are so forceful about defending this activity. Y'all are so forceful about defending this activity because you know that shit is nasty. You know it is. That's why you're so defensive about it. You know it's nasty. I just can't believe it's that many of y'all out here living this life. That's why you got to wear them shower shoes. Anyway, y'all nasty. Appreciate the question. See what's going on. What else you got here? Is Ice Cube going to have to get deplatformed if he doesn't chill on the conspiracy memes? Um, so here's the thing for me about the idea of deplatforming Ice Cube for conspiracy memes. Um, I mean, if that's your play, I, I get it. I just want to know when you became aware of Ice Cube, right? Because this is kind of sort of what made him famous. I believe we may have talked about this on this podcast, but something I'll never forget, right? Didn't Bill Maher 
he he got in trouble for calling somebody a house in word, right? You remember that? I think he did it like on the television show. I, I mean, I'm pretty sure it was him using the N word, but he did something that he generally is not allowed to do. And the next week they made him go out there and do something that I know he never, ever, 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 ever thought he'd have to do, which is to come out here and bow down on his own television show where he says whatever he wants. You know what I mean? Like, I, I mean, I, I, I believe that for Bill Maher, it was just the most stunning thing in the world that he had to come and give this apology. But he swallowed his pride and did it. That man make like eight figures doing that show, right? So he, you know, he held up. But what I'll never forget about it is the guest on that show was Q. And my assumption is that Cube was already scheduled to be a guest. And the reason that's my assumption is because he was on um, – promoting a 25th anniversary re-release of death certificate you know his second album and that was the reason why he was on there now let me pull up the track listing on death certificate right because this i think is kind of important what songs are on death certificate all right death certificate has a feature from khalid abdul muhammad um that one's got Black Korea on it. It's got No Vaseline on it. Uh, and this is like, Death Certificate Cube is kind of full nation at this point. You know, like he's as closely related to the nation at this point as he has ever been. Can you imagine, imagine how Bill Maher had to feel sitting in that chair being lectured by Ice Cube on what he can and cannot say while this dude is promoting the album that has no Vaseline on it. Like, Think about that for a second. I don't know if I could have swallowed my pride under those circumstances if I was that man. I absolutely 100% cannot say that with confidence. Can you? Can you really? All right. Now, I bring that up in relation to what Cube is doing on the Internet right now, because the thing I was talking to a homie about the other day that's wild about seeing what he's tweeting about. Somehow he has apparently the exact same politics that he had in 1992. How is that possible? And, by the way, not discussed nearly enough. How in the world did he manage a career in Hollywood after making some of those records? Like, did everybody else not like Jerry Heller, too? Like, when you really stop and think about it, like, the whole arc of this for him has been, like, wildly improbable. But I say all that to say, if he's been allowed to get to where he has thus far, do I think he's going to get deplatformed? I find it highly unlikely. Apparently, he exists in a space where we've decided he can kind of just do whatever. Like, I don't know what Ice Cube would have to say to actually prove to be like legitimately controversial and make us be like, yo, I think we got to get Cube about the paint. Like, I don't have an answer for what it would be. Appreciate the question. Let me see what else we got here. Man, J. Cole stepped in it, huh? All right, so the whole J. Cole thing in total um, is interesting. I guess it's now a long time ago. I guess like eight years ago. 
Um, I did an interview with him after a show in uh, Greensboro. He can rap. He's made some good music. Like he's one of these cats that needs to stop making his own beats. Um, but like I generally think he's a pretty talented dude. That uh, that KOD record I think is the last one of his that I listened to, and I thought that one actually banged. Right. Um, he's not quite as like smart or deep as his fans would like you to believe, but he's good enough. You know what I mean? Um, like that's where he is, but he clearly has like issues with women. Like there's, there's really no way around that. And he ain't the first rapper to have those issues, but I think that part of it is in the way that he positions himself. Um, like how much room is there really for him to like, you can't claim to be so enlightened and then seem to have it so wrong on women. Like he did, but the no role model song, which I just thought was like, wow, problematic and everything else. But anyway, what I'm describing there is some of the, I don't know if baggage is the right word, but that's kind of the track record that he brings with him into anything that he does. And so I don't know who this no name person is that apparently this new song um, is about, but I listened to the song and I do have to say, uh, he was kind of killing it, right? <laughs> like, lyrically it was strong he can really rap like all of that okay cool but in the end this dude made a diss record about a woman i've never heard of that's like no no like what are you doing like, what is this? Like, it was one of those where it's like nobody told you what the tone of this will wind up being. Uh, and so it's interesting. I'm looking at it on Genius, and the description of it on Genius is the song's called Snow on the Bluff. And it's Snow on the Bluff is J. Cole's first release of 2020. On the song, which is titled after a January 2011 film about a robbery in Atlanta, Cole delivers a single continuous verse that speaks on various issues facing the United States, including police brutality, wealth inequality, and racism. He also asks for his fans not to idolize him, wanting to instead be perceived as a regular person. Um, although not explicitly stated, the first part of the track is likely a response to no names perceived criticisms of Cole on Twitter. She has frequently stated she is against capitalism and celebrity culture, two things Cole raps about in his verses. And I personally cannot imagine being J. Cole and getting up and like responding to some tweets. Now I understand that this, oh, okay. So this woman is a rapper or a performer of some sorts. Like I honestly don't know anything about it. I just clicked on the link and I see this now. Okay. She herself is also a rapper. I feel a little differently about him doing it, given that she is actually a rapper. Um, But this ain't a great look. Like, I think that's the, the biggest thing is it ain't a great look. Like, I think if you like when I listen to it without having the context, it struck me that it kept being addressed to a she, she, this, she, that all that she stuff. And like, it almost felt like some unnecessary, like black girl lost type shit. Right. Where like some dude is coming to lecture this woman um, because she's out here tweeting about everything, but not doing nothing. You know what I mean? Like that, that was the tone that I took from it. I didn't realize this woman was actually a rapper and maybe she going to battle back at him. I don't know, but it does not look good when you carry some of the things that he carries into this, that you just going to come out here and make a battle track about that woman like that. And I think it's fair to be like, so what you trying to say, bruh? Appreciate the question. Let's see what else you got here.
Somebody said, has anyone ever addressed you the way Cole got at no name? I mean, people don't really rap about me. Although, I think this dude was in Kansas City. Somebody made a diss song about me once. You can Google it. Look it up on YouTube. I think it's called Fuck Bomani Jones. It's up there. Oh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Insecure season finale. That's all it says. Insecure season finale. All right, so I made a decision this year with Insecure. I think I might have done it last year with Insecure. I'm honestly not sure, but I know I did it this year with Insecure. And the decision that I made with Insecure was I was not going to watch it with y'all. Now, that decision was made easier by uh, the Jordan doc being on and coming on at the same time and all of that. That made it easier for me to be like, I ain't watching this with y'all. But, man, y'all be taking that shit way too personal, man. Like, I call it the Black Civil War. Like, Issa and her people have found a show that does an amazing job of finding fairly mundane things that people are really passionate about and will argue about for a week and change, you know? And I don't, like, if y'all want to talk about the TV show, that's cool, but I don't want to talk about y'all. Like, I don't want to think about y'all's, like, no, no. And that's what it all, like, it's the internet discussion. It all stops being about the actual TV show. And all becomes about some shit you've been through yourself, something that you did. It is brilliant that they've captured that. Now, the thing for me with the last two seasons of Insecure is I think they've both been, like, fairly brilliant, right? Like, as, as a visual product, it's amazing. It's shot very well. Like, everything about the aesthetic is great. The music supervision um, is fantastic. The scenes they get, they capture L.A., I think, in a very interesting way. And they capture Black Los Angeles in a very interesting way and, and give it they give black LA a shine that you don't really typically see in stuff that's set in black LA in large part, the stuff that's set in black LA. We mostly think about like hood movies and stuff like that. Right. Um, but you know, all the presentation stuff is great. All of it is. Um, I had long had problems because I just found so many of the characters to be unlikable, but I also got to be honest with myself to an extent that, I think that was some of my own projection that's coming there because I just found all the characters to be ridiculous, but there's room for people to be ridiculous. We watch TV shows about ridiculous people all the time, right? Um, so anyway, what the show to me has kind of evolved into, and I guess this isn't, I guess this isn't terribly different from what it's always been, but I do think that and maybe it's because we kind of first become aware of Issa in a comedic sense, and she is a bit you know, of a comedian of sorts. But the show isn't really a comedy. And, and the reason I say that it's not a comedy is this. Very little, if any, of the humor is dictated by the situation. So maybe I'm saying it's not a sitcom, right? But, like, the plot twist is rarely funny. Does that make sense? Like, the joke is not in the plot. The jokes are all around the plot, right? The jokes are almost Easter eggs in a way. And so this comedy is kind of sprinkled in to the foundation of this plot. And so it's funny enough, but itself is like kind of serious you know like you think about this for a second with the exception of uh 
Somebody tell me her name so I don't describe her in a way that people find to be insensitive. You know who I'm talking about. The one that's funny all the time. One of these girls. Come on, somebody put it in the chat. Don't make me do it. Save me from myself. Somebody put Kelly. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um. Anyway, yes, uh, Kelly. Like, Kelly funny all the time. She's there to be funny when these other people aren't. That's what it is. Like, I found it kind of crazy that uh, old girl Yvonne got an HBO special doing stand-up. I haven't seen it. I don't know anything about her stand-up. I'm not going to judge her stand-up. But the only thing I know her from, she's not funny on. Like, Molly provides you the zero comedy provided by that actress or that character. That's not what that that's just not where it comes from. Um, but it's kind of interesting because just about everybody else gives you comedy in some form or fashion. Like, Molly don't give you none. Anyway, so the finale. I think the show has developed very well is what I'm saying. I think it's become a very good product. I enjoy it, right? I hate watched it at a point, but no, I enjoy it. Anyway, so to the finale. Let me tell you what happened to me a little bit on the internet. Because, again, I don't be watching this on the internet with y'all because I just don't think that's a good idea. So I was stunned. And if you haven't watched the finale, spoiler alert, whatever, right? Um, old girl told old buddy that she was pregnant. Which, honestly, I feel like he kind of should have halfway seen coming when she hit him with the, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you in person. And you know that you've been shooting the club up. Like, this was well within the realm of possibility, brother. Like, I don't, I mean, I am not a club up shooter as a lifestyle. It's just not how I get down. Never have, never, well, can't say never. You get married, it's a different story. Anyway, you get where I'm coming from here. That ain't really my speed. I feel like you cast this out here living like that. How are you not scared to death every month? Like, I don't, like, I cannot relate to that. How are you not shook every month? Like, if I was engaging like that dude engages, and don't forget, uh, whatchamacallit, um, he, uh, he, he, he had it, uh, in his face like a can of mace, baby. Didn't he have that in that one season? It was burning. Fucking now he learning. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. So we know what his get down is. Yeah. I don't see how you not shook all the time. Like when she hits you with the yo, I need to talk to you in person. You should have known exactly what that was. So anyway, buddy goes over there. And she tells him that she's pregnant. And of course. He loses it. And she tells him that she's keeping it. And my dude said in response, and I quote, why? What? He said, why? Maybe, maybe, maybe. I am just 10 times more considerate than I realize, right? Maybe I am at the next level of considering women's feelings in moments as such. Maybe. I don't know, right? And again, I haven't been in this situation. Maybe I don't know how I'm going to act. But I feel like if a woman tells you she's pregnant, Asking if she's going to keep it, probably a question that you should skip. At least on that day. Right? Like you just found out she's pregnant. You might want to sleep on it, brother. You might want to sleep on it. You know, but no, no, no. He asked her and he hit her with why? Why? 
So I said on the tweets, this fool said why. I said it that night. And then the next morning I said it, but I added a detail. And the detail was, I can't believe that you're going to ask a woman, presumably in her 30s, why she's going to keep the baby. And I don't know if putting the presumably in her 30s part was a step too far on my part. I don't think it was. Okay? And maybe I've just lived a little more life than most people. All of that stuff, right? But at this point in my life, I feel pretty confident that if I were to have sex with a woman and she were to get pregnant and she was in her 30s, I don't think I need to ask her if she's going to keep it. Particularly if she doesn't have any children. Somebody in the chat room says, L-M-A-O, sound like you're implying she's on the clock. I'm not implying that she's on the clock. The clock is there. Like, everybody's on the clock. Whatever clock it happens to be, everybody's on it. And you closer to the end of the clock in your 30s than you are in your 20s. Right. Right. So anyway, I had some women, and it really wasn't that many to be clear, but I had people pop up and act like I was the one who was wrong for saying that Lawrence was wrong for asking why. You know the biggest reason why it's wrong of him to ask why? Number one, because it don't matter. That's the biggest one. Why is she keeping it? Because she going to keep it. Your opinion doesn't really have much weight under these circumstances. You may not like it, but that's what it is, right? That's number one. The number two reason not to ask why is the answer I want to have a baby. Like, I don't know if you have paid much attention to, like, the human race, to, like, the species or whatever it is, but there's, you know, pretty significant theory out there that we all exist with an innate desire to propagate the species. This is what it is. What are you talking about? This fool was like, why? Why do you want to have a baby? Again, I'll say it again. I'm assuming pretty much that any woman that I were to get pregnant would like to have my child. They may not necessarily want to have my child in particular, but if they want to have a child and I came up on the wheel of genetic options, I'm pretty sure she's going to say yes. And also, let me be clear. While I pointed out where I am on the uh, genetic wheel, it also got a little something to do with that uh, that 1040. You know what I'm saying? That W2. It's a good place to stop. You could do worse. You could do worse. Whether I'm around or not, you could do worse. Somebody here said that's an ill, humble brag. Let me explain something to you. Ain't nothing really bragging, bragging about being in your 30s and the idea that someone would be willing to have a child that you put half on. Do you realize how many of these like just just outright scoundrels, no good dudes that people are having their babies? Look around you, man. It ain't a high standard. Like some you always got to remember about parenting. Think about everybody you know. Think about everybody you ever met. Think about every fuck up that's done you wrong in one form or fashion, right? All of them. What? 80? 
80-something percent of them going to wind up being somebody's parent. Right? Like, it's a really low bar. Really, 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 really low bar. People, generally speaking, want to have children, especially if they can afford them. They want to have kids. And this woman says she's having a baby, and his response is, why? And I've seen people in the chat room talking about this, and I saw it on Twitter. They're like, well, she had the chance to have kids in her marriage. Right. And she didn't. And now the chance to have a child has reemerged. So what's she supposed to say? Nah, I didn't want to do it then. Don't want to do it now. How much sense that make? Like, I really could not believe that I had people pushing back at me for saying that this dude was wrong in that moment where this woman is obviously vulnerable and nervous and afraid to talk to you. And she's decided she wants to have a baby that's yours. And your response is, why? Why? And people were mad at me. Not a whole lot, but still. The fact that any one of y'all was mad at me. And then all the dude, he got the right to ask that. I mean, I guess he got the right to ask, but she ain't got to answer. Dude, that's the thing. She ain't got to answer nothing to you at that point. Like, you got to make peace with that reality, right? Once you decided to uh, show up to the party, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, once, you, once you went skinny dipping, homie, you went skinny dipping. Cops showed up. What you going to do? Hands up. Ain't nothing you can do. Put your hands up. It's your only option. That's it. And that's the roll of the dice when you be out here doing that. I thought y'all were aware of that fact. But is and Molly getting back cool again. That'll be interesting to kind of peep and see how um, that goes. Molly, I got to say, boy, they created a wildly unlikable character with that one. Like, I don't really find myself disliking any of the other characters at this point. They made a crazy unlikable character with her. And I think, and again, this is what this show does. It puts you into this personal place. Because the personality characteristic that they gave Molly is somebody who can't say that she's wrong. And that. That's all bad. That Asian dude wasn't having it, though, was he? No, sir. DJ Theo was like, yo, I've had enough of this. Did uh did anybody get that joke other than Lance? <laughs> okay, Lance got it. Somebody had to get it. <laughs> <laughs> yo, I in fact, as I was saying this, I wanted to look it up and see if that dude was DJ Theo. Tell me he don't sound like DJ Theo. We say this also for DJ Theo. DJ Theo had all the swag. All the swag. Like, let me tell you what, and I can't remember if this was discussed in the plot, right? Like, they explicitly talked about this. That might have been the first time that Molly had dated some Asian dude, but that was not the first time DJ Theo had brought a sister into VIP. No, sir, e Bob. He'd been down that road before. He, he had all the game. Like, he was ready for it. And then he just looked at her, and he was just like, nope. I have had enough. I had to hurt for her, though, I'm sure. Because the way to talk about it, man, she, I mean, look, man, relationships and how you navigate them and all that stuff is hard as hell, right? And at her age, she said she had never been in a relationship as long as she had been in one with that dude. And I do think that this is, I mean, uh, just generally speaking, that like find figuring out how exactly to include people into your life is a very difficult thing, especially when the only context in which you really thought about this inclusion is like how to do all your stuff and then get somebody else there. Right. Um, 
Like it, it take a while to learn that you can't exactly do it like that. You can't. That's not going to work. So I don't know what that next season going to look like. Like, no idea uh, whatsoever how that one's going to go. Well, except for the fact that, like, Lawrence and the Condola chick are going to move in together. That one right there is a guarantee. You write that down. And you tell you, he might have got a new job, but it ain't been that long since he was working at Best Buy. He ain't got that much money. He going to need to put all them bills in the same place. All right. Appreciate the question. Let me see what else you got here. Is 846 Chappelle's masterpiece? Hmm. That is interesting because guys like him, we always tend to try to find something that's not the most famous thing that they've done and then make that thing the masterpiece, right? It's like we find a live album, for example, that we pick out for an artist, be like, yo, 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 this is really the one. Like we all try not to make it the one that's everything. So for me, about 846, you kind of got two discussions here, right? Um, one discussion is what it is. The other discussion is what it's not. All right. What it is, is a masterpiece. There's no way around that. It is absolutely brilliant um, for a number of reasons. And I've been like trying to figure out a way to write this, but I didn't. And so I guess I'll give it to you here. Here's what I find very interesting about what Chappelle did um, with this show. And all right, I'm going to broaden this and then bring it back in. All right. So you're going to need to work with me for a little bit here. I've read a lot of op-ed pieces um, from black writers, largely from what I can tell young black writers in the last uh, three weeks or so about, you know, all the stuff that's going on in the streets and everything else. And I'm here to tell you guys, we are developing from what I can tell what must be, the worst generation of opinion writers that we've ever produced. Like, I mean, just people writing bad columns. And I'm seeing bad columns in very reputable, like, papers and outlets. To me, their columns are awful. Awful. And I will tell you why I think their columns are awful. And who knows, somebody watching this might have written one of those columns or or listening to this might have written one of those columns or you know somebody who did. And I'll tell you what it is, right? This is the problem I've had with all these columns. I don't give a fuck about how you feel. I don't. Give me what you think, right? Give me something for my brain to work around. But I don't care when I'm reading a column in the New York Times or in the Washington Post or any of those places. I don't care that these white folks hurt your feelings. I don't want to hear about how racism makes you feel. Because what we are talking about is so much bigger than you. It's so much bigger than the white folks looking at you crazy because you in a fancy shore and they think that you don't have the money. It's so much bigger than whatever that crazy thing is that your boss said to you in the office. It is not about you, right? What we're talking about, what needs to be fixed and what needs to be addressed is not about you. It is about something much, much bigger and i hate reading all these columns that are the goal is to make the audience empathize with you right it's like the goal of it is to get the reader to come give you a hug afterward 
or to make the reader feel bad afterward or something like that, right? Or to express your personal defiance of these things. And that's not what I want to hear from you, right? Tell me about something bigger. Tell me about something broader. Make some connections here. But what I'm not about to do, Brian said it right there, it's too much of I, and it's correct. It's way too much first person in these essays. Like when you go and read them, like think about this now that I've said it, and think about how often what you read, how much of that is first person, right? How much is that? And I hate it. So anyway, um, I wanted to write this first person thing about Dave. <laughs> um, and this is why. And this is like where it was like a little tricky for me on that. But this is this is what, what I got for you. And it actually ties into what I'm saying about those columns and part of what I don't dig about those columns and where this becomes my own personal issue, perhaps, and not something broader, though. I think my analysis of what's broader is legitimate. I will give you what I think. I will not give you what I feel. Quite honestly, you do not deserve that. Right? How I feel is mine. I'm not an artist. That's not that's not what I do. That's not how I get down. I am going to give you what I see. But generally speaking, I'm not going to give you how I feel. I think in a lot of ways, it is beneath me and my dignity to ask for these strangers to empathize with me. And I can't say that there's never been moments that I haven't in my work done that in some form or fashion, right? Like, I can't say that I'm 100% on it, but I'm not, that's not where I am. I am personally kind of much more protective of self in that way. Um, I can make you feel something, but I'm not really giving you my feelings, which is to say, I suppose one might argue that consuming my content, it's a lot like dating me. Anyway, um, and so what jumped out to me about 846 was in a way that I don't recall ever seeing from Dave before. He gave us what he felt. Like I can't even, even the one Netflix special where it's basically just him sitting in the stool, like the small club one. Um, he gave you a lot of thoughts and he connected but he didn't really give you how he felt. It's just not what he did. And in this one, he did. And so this all jumps out to me. And the reason why I wanted to like talk about it in a first person sort of way is some of you know this. Um, my entire approach to producing content and professional communication in the profession that I'm in. It's all based on Dave. It is all 100% based on Dave. And when I re when it really like crystallized for me what I wanted my content to be and what I wanted my work to do was uh Dave Chappelle's Block Party 2004. And if you haven't seen it you need to see it. It's actually a like a legitimately great film um and the thing about the block party as i watched it and i just noticed so basically you know if you haven't seen it it starts with him in uh dayton or wherever that is in ohio he's from dayton's like the, the nearest city or whatever and so it's him in dayton and he basically just goes around town giving random people tickets to get on a bus and ride to New York to go to this block party that he had in bed -Stuy. And so you got like old white ladies 
like middle-aged cat daddy type black dudes like with black lips and box haircuts um the band from central state he bust them up so that they could be part of the show like all of this and it was really just based on a fundamental premise that we are more alike than we realize and look what happens if we just kick it right like you ain't gonna change the world like this necessarily but it's kind of the truth you know like that that's his thing on it it's just hey man we can all kick it and when you go do like Chappelle stuff there's really no telling who's gonna wind up being there like it's a really interesting cross-section of people uh that you wind up with but I remember watching that in the way that he communicated the way that he talked about it and just kind of the way that he carried himself around all of that stuff and I was like this is what I want my work to do this is how I want my work to connect with people is right here. Right. And then the way he like the actual messaging of the stuff that he does. And that's what I want. The coding of it is so amazing and so incredible in the ways that like while he's doing something. He can talk to one group of people directly in front of the other group of people, make the other group of people laugh, even though they don't know what the joke is, while the uh, while the people he's actually talking to are act are like truly getting it. Like the mastery in your mind that you have to have to understand everything that's around you to allow you to package it in a way that can be that the same words can be heard by so many people in different ways that all still manage to impact those people, even if they're not fully getting what he's saying, right? That's the guy. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be that smart. I wanted to be that relatable. I wanted to be like that plain spoken, all of those things. I wanted to be that fearless, like all of that. Like that's the guy who does work. That's like, I, I do my work obviously in a much different space, but the characteristics that I think make his work jump out are the characteristics that I would like ideally for people to say jump out of my work and the characteristics that I work toward achieving, right? So for me, watching Dave do 846, it's not just like simply watching a master at work. For me, it is kind of like watching, I don't know if sensei is the right word, but it's like, it's watching the guy that I've been trying to be like in a lot of ways and not in a mimicry or, a imi- or like a, a way like with imitating. You know what I mean? Um, it's not that. So anyway, um, it's in- it was interesting for me to then see that guy do something that I don't do and that he doesn't really do, which is to sit up there and give you how he feels. And he really didn't try to give you how he felt because a lot of it was just gleaned in tone. You know, like a lot of it was just gleaned in like in the emotion and that he had where he gave it or whatever. But I personally, for a number of reasons, I don't have the comfort to um, give you how I feel in that way. I don't know if it's a lack of confidence necessarily, but I don't have the comfort. Like that stuff's too important to me to just give away. It's a little bit too important for me to just sell. Like I don't really have that. But the next level of what he did in that special was the ability to add that feeling. Like, you know what it is in a lot of ways? It's Blueprint. Like for Jay-Z, like the thing for Jay-Z, for people who weren't around when Blueprint came out, like the thing about Blueprint was, and the reason it got such great press is this is Jay-Z. He's not just a rapper. He's an artist. You know what I mean? Like, like this can't be life on Dynasty was kind of the bridge to it, right? Like that's the, that's the proto- blueprint record and then you get your blueprint and then it all kind of goes in that way but you got a lot more emotional jay he hadn't been good at being emotional jay before he tried but he wasn't especially good at it like a lot of us like you must love me all volume one but you go back and listen to it it's not a very good song he's trying because he can't but, but he's not there yet he's not in that place of that comfort or any of that um and it was just very interesting for me to watch someone 
And like for myself personally, I was then in a place of, I don't know if reevaluation or whatever is the word, but I was in a place of like, huh, why won't I give you how I feel? You know, I got my reasons I could tell you, but are they really what they are? You know, like, why, why is that me? Why am I not inclined to give you like, give you that? When are the times when it is appropriate? Because like I watch these people and they put all kinds of folks on TV right now to talk about the world and everything else. And I've been one of those people. But what, what they're not about, what I'm not about to do is tell you how I feel. Because mm. here's the thing. If I didn't have a problem with what's going on with the world, the shit would still be wrong. Like how I feel isn't the point. It's not. Like the right and wrong of it is pretty is basic. But how I feel is not the point. And I guess I wonder to a degree, especially when we're talking about the larger macro things. It would be a pretty painful thing to pour out how you feel about this stuff in front of the world and have people still not do shit. You know? Well, it would be awful. And as I look and as this stuff in the world keeps going on a little bit longer and longer, we're getting a whole lot closer to the point of people not doing shit. We're getting there. We're really close. But Dave gave us how he felt for that special. And it made it that good. It made it that brilliant. It made it that important, in part because you drove that man to that place. I thought his self-awareness about the celebrity stuff and everything else, like all of that was brilliant. The flip side of it, of course, I think I got into this beginning, is that this about what that was what it is. What it isn't, though, or what it doesn't have, it's fair to point out, there are no mentions of women in the special. Now, the thing I will say, and I don't even think this is a defense of him, but I do think this is an observation. Every victim of police brutality that he mentioned was for a specific device. Like it was not a roll call. You know what I mean? Every single one that he pointed out was for a reason. And so who knows? Maybe there was not a reason that these other cases did not come up or whatever it was. But this comes up off the baggage of some of the last couple of specials that he has, right? Because the thing about Dave is Dave ain't no perfect dude. Like, he ain't got to talk about this cat like he's some sort of saint. When he talked about, like, Me Too and the Louis C.K. stuff, he talked about it like a dude who was cool with the dudes that was getting hell. That didn't come off well. Um, the stuff that he really has to answer for for a lot of people is the jokes that he made about trans people um, in one of those specials. And Dave operates on the premise that it doesn't matter as long as it's funny, and he refuses to buckle on that. Now, my contention has been that's an appropriate rule, perhaps for a comedy club. Once you get twenty five million dollars a special, then I do think you have to think about things in a much in much more of a macro sense. And I think that the people make a fair point of how do you expect others? How do you expect ask others for empathy while you demonstrate none toward trans people in this special in that one special? I don't think he demonstrates none in total, but he, de he didn't demonstrate it there. Right. I think those people are making a fair point in the macro. But like if I dropped this particular special off and you didn't know that those others existed, you would say standing alone that it is a masterpiece. And therefore it is. That fact does not change because of what it's not. But the criticisms of what it's not, I think, are legitimate. I think that they are valid. And I don't blame people for wanting more for him when it comes to the trans stuff. But see, this is the thing. I tweeted about this. The reason that 846 works is the ridiculous level of trust that Dave has with his audience. Right. Like only he could like just sit there in that way and have people hanging on every word because there is a spectacular level of trust that those people have in him. That trust for a lot of people was betrayed. By the stuff that he said about trans folks. You know, so if you're going to use that trust to get those people in and to get us to listen to. 846 like we did right that's how you're going to use that trust then you got to operate with an appreciation for what that means to these other people and he is not and as a result you have some people who put up a wall and their thing is i don't want to hear anything that dave has to say until he addresses that 
And I think that's fair for them. Um, however, I myself am not going to dismiss this entirely because of something fucked up that he did otherwise. Now, maybe you can say it's easy for me to do because he's not talking about me. I think that's something to be said. But also, I mean, I'm also black in America. I've had to let white folks slide for a whole lot of stuff. But I also get why those folks are done with it. They ain't letting nobody else lie for nothing. I get it, you know. Um, and I think maybe I look at this from a different place also because I cr create content in public in a very like in a mass distributed sort of way. You know, I know what can go wrong or whatever it is. I know I don't necessarily myself want to be defined. Right. So that's my 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 privilege to a degree speaking with empathy toward this man who also possesses a measure of privilege. Um, but I just think there's room to say that he's messed up on the trans stuff and he's dead on about this stuff. Even if he got some of it not quite right. Anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Evening Jones. You do this here a couple times a week. My man, uh, Lance Gilliam, handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Uh, remember, if you can't watch The Evening Jones live, subscribe to the podcast. Subscribe at the iTunes Store. Subscribe at Stitcher Radio. Check us out at SoundCloud. We are also at the Google Play Store. And I'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Oh, no, other podcast. Probably next week. Take it easy.